very happy to be here to introduce um, Julia Petit, uh, our speaker for today. Uh, Julie is a professor of anthropology and the director of Middle East and Islamic Studies at the University of Louisville in Kentucky. She received her PhD from Wayne State University and specializes in legal anthropology, displacement and refugees, gender, resistance and culture, transnationalism and human rights. She's the author most recently of Space and Mobility in Palestine, forthcoming mm -hmm. from the University of Pennsylvania Press, which is an examination of Israeli policies of closure and separation and their associated physical structures, bureaucratic requirements, and procedures. She's also the author of Landscape of Hope and Despair, Palestinian Refugee Camps and Gender, and another uh, separate title, Gender and Crisis, Women in the Palestinian Resistance Movement. So she's really a specialist on Palestine, which is, <laughs> we were talking earlier about how at, at a certain point in one's career, you just, you get, your imagination gets sparked by a different topic, and you see uh, where it takes you, so we're very happy. We'd love to have you talk about Palestine as well, <laughs> but uh, today we're having her talk about her new project. Um, in the spring of 2014, Julie traveled to uh, Jordan on a grant from the National Endowment for Humanities to work on a project delineating the cultural politics of bats. This project explored the revival and popularity of Turkish bats in Jordan in the context of their cultural refashioning. We're very pleased that she's here today to present this research to us. Please join me in welcoming Professor Julie Petit to the scene. Thank you. Okay. As you heard from um, Emily's description of what I do, this is completely out of my usual <laughs> area of um, research. And uh, there's a, a history there as to what, why am I doing this uh, project on baths. And part of it is just you know an age in one's career when you feel like doing something completely new and different, immersing yourself in a new um, set of literature. Um, and I'm having a lot of fun doing this. Uh, it, for me, it's very much a learning process. I'm reading a whole new set of literature, things I never thought I'd be working on, um, and asking lots of new questions. Um, but it came out of this interest in the Hamams, also came out of the research I was doing in the West Bank, where um, businesses that had operated in Nablus were moving to Ramallah because Nablus was under sort of this closure, under siege, if you will. And Nablus is well known for its baths. And so suddenly in Ramallah, which is really a big village, there are this, this what people call the Turkish bath, which itself is a whole problematic concept. Um, and so people would go to this bath in Ramallah, and it became a great way to relax after doing field work in a conflict setting. And I had worked in conflict settings for 30, 35 years, and I thought, oh, as an anthropologist, I want to do something just once that is a little bit fun and a little bit different and not so dangerous, um, and do something on the Middle East that's very um, creative and pleasant and not just conflict. So that's how I came to this research. And at the same time, when I was going in and out of the West Bank, I was going through Jordan. and there was this sort of new phenomenon in Jordan popping up, and that was what people were calling Turkish baths. And there were quite a few uh, popping up, and so I started asking, what is this, and uh, why are they uh, opening these baths, and what's going on in them? So in any case, um, I started asking questions. I'll go back to some of the overarching questions, and one has to do with the whole notion of the Mediterranean. And, you know, this is it's more than just an imagined geographic locale. I mean, it's a, it's a materiality, it's a sea linking North Africa, Southern Europe, the Middle East. And in this Mediterranean, there are a whole host of um, features, economic, social, cultural, ecological, that have historically enabled us, enabled us to call this a region. And I'm always interested in an anthropologist who works on space as to what is a region and what constitutes a region. Uh, why do we call some things regions? And the Mediterranean, we, we, many of us know sort of the, the standard, you know, what makes the Mediterranean, aside from the sea, of course, things like the olive industry, diet, we all know the Mediterranean diet, um, trade, conquest and conflict, urban formations, migration, as we're seeing now with the tremendous number of um, people trying to cross the Mediterranean, tourism, and a host of you know, loosely cultural values and religious practices. And within this 
orbit of region, I said, well, you know, these baths and communal bathings are another feature that goes into constituting the Mediterranean. It is something that is similar. There's a continuity there, you know, from Spain all the way around through Turkey, uh, through the uh, Arab Middle East onto North Africa, um, that goes back, you know, well before even the Hellenistic period. And so, you know, this is the feature I'm looking at in terms of the Mediterranean. And baths are both a spatial form and they're a practice, a cultural practice. They are imbued with sacred meanings, uh, very profane meanings, meanings, but they kind of um, forge historical, architectural, and cultural uh, aesthetic also about the body. And while I say these are common Mediterranean uh, spaces and practices, tremendous local variation throughout time and, and space, even though they get glossed now as Turkish baths. Um, and you know, trying to trace where did this concept come from. Now, by the mid 20th century in this region, the public bath had pretty much died out, okay, except in many parts of North African urban areas where it continued as a, what we call living tradition, same in parts of Syria, uh, parts of Turkey. Um, it was often sort of lower income people using the, uh, the public baths, but they died out among the middle class and certainly the upper class. And you know, questions are pretty easy to answer. What happened? Indoor plumbing uh, comes onto the scene. Uh, the spread of ideas that baths were unhygienic. And people were writing in the press at this time about these are really dirty places. It's part of the science and modernity uh, kind of discourse that these places are full of germs. Uh, they're associated with poor people often and moral questions. Uh, what, what goes on in these uh, spaces? Because in the baths, it's the most intimate of uh, bodily functions taking place in a semi-public space. And nudity is always uh, problematic. So the baths, having sort of diminished, especially the grand baths, the grand urban baths, are now back. Uh, in many parts of the region. And unfortunately, because of events in Syria, I could not go to Syria. And this is the big gap um, in this research. I went to Turkey, uh, Jordan mainly, and um, southern Spain. And Syria will just have to, um, to wait. But these new baths and this immerse yourself in history is a, um, it's on the advertisement for one of the baths in Spain. And actually that's the, uh, this is a bath in Madrid. Uh, it's a chain. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, there are a lot of, it was, it was fun field work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, this is their poster, their advertisement, Immerse Yourself in History. Um, and they call these Arab baths. Though I don't, you see what makes them Arab, I don't know. They're really more like Roman because they're immersion pools. And the key thing about Arab Islamic baths is you don't immerse in water. You don't sit in water. But in any case, they call it whatever they want and it, it works, I guess. Yeah, this is their, their logo. This is a corporation actually, Hamam al-Andalus, bathing, bathed history. With these baths, they, what they do is they combine everything from the Hellenistic period, the Roman, the Byzantine, through the um, very early Islamic baths, the very simple baths, which you, the only place I think you can see them is out in the Jordanian desert, in the desert castles, where they have these beautiful old hammams. Some of the first pieces of Islamic architecture are out there, and they're very simple uh, structures. Um, so these new baths, with their immersion pools, and uh, cold pools, which are also not part of the Arab uh, or Ottoman baths, they combine a multitude of forms and it's sort of sorting out what they have pieced together. So these baths, they're not simply recuperating tradition, they're not recuperating um, heritage, they're, it's this cultural remnants that are, that are being pieced together. It's a recombining of a lot of different elements for new purposes and a whole new set of consumers. Okay. Now, 
these baths are taking shape in a global uh, phenomenon, and that is spa culture. Spas are a big part of tourism. If you notice, hotels these days globally have spas, and people want spas. They want that spa experience. And um, the bath is part spa, part bath. I call many of them spaths because it's very hard to sort out what is what. Um, and within the Middle East, or within Jordan, there are very luxurious baths, such as this one in Amman. This is Elf Leila Wo Leila, uh, which is quite posh and very expensive, down to this very simple neighborhood bath in Amman. Okay? Very tiny little neighborhood bath without even a sign. The only sign they have says, men not allowed. And um, it's part of a salon, and nobody really knows about it except local. Uh, local women. Okay, so from these very simple ones to that's Borsa, which is a whole nother story, to those very posh baths. Okay, so you know, baths in Jordan are very interesting because in Jordan you don't have a history of the grand urban baths because Amman was not an urban center in the way we think of Damascus or Istanbul uh, or even Jerusalem or Nablus. Um, they did not have this history, but what they did have is they have an old history of Roman baths and early Islamic baths that sort of get very glossed over. Um, so when you ask people in Jordan about the baths, they say, oh, we got it from the Turks. Everything is the Turks. The Turks brought it. Well, Turks did not bring the baths to Jordan. The baths, uh, you have fabulous Roman baths and Hellenistic baths and the early, early Islamic baths there. But in any case, people like to talk about them as Turkish, and that, that is for a reason. Um, so Jordan doesn't have this living tradition. They don't still have functioning baths the way, say, Damascus does or cities um, in Morocco. But what Jordan does have also going way back in history are the mineral baths in the Jordan Valley that people still use, the pools, take the family and go spend a day down in Shuna or al Hamma. Okay? So in this project, what I've been trying to do is look at the relationship relationships among the cultural politics of heritage, tourism and leisure industries, uh, cultural and religious notions of the bodies, neoliberal practices in the consuming body, and the whole notion of region. How are people in this region, what are they talking about when they give names to things? And I go into a section here on naming. So, you know, I'm sort of arguing that these baths are part recuperation of a once nearly dead practice, combined with sort of neoliberal commodifications of heritage and the new touristic focus on experience. Okay. Now, the clientele that use the baths, and here I'll use Jordan, and the, and the cost, they're very expensive. These are not baths that people can go to even once a week. Um, something like, uh, like this bath, the minimum price you're going to pay is around $75 for a two-hour uh, session, okay? So it's, it's, and here I'm talking about women, basically. It, it's women with disposable income, a lot of young professional uh, women. Or um, this is, anybody recognize this? Been there. Yeah, <laughs> that's the... Sultan Harim. This is one of Sinan's, the architect Sinan's bath that has been renovated and um, absolutely fabulous inside. And of course, now it's combined with a cafe. You know, all these baths are combined with other sorts of uh, leisure activities. I mean, the minimum cost here is about $100, again, for about two hours. So this is not, these are for people with, with money. Okay, uh, that's the inside of it. It's the standard, like, it's very, you know, the old Ottoman, the three wooden tiers, um, and the very vast, vast rooms um, for bathing. Okay. Now, so in these baths in, you know, Jordan, there is what I call nostalgia without memory. This is a Paterai talks about this, where you have nostalgia for something that you really don't have a memory of. But you know, I ask people, well, how do you know about the baths, these young girls? And um, 
you know, and in Jordan, we have to remember most of these, uh, vast majority of these young women using the baths are Palestinians. So their parents are from coastal cities or Nablus or Jerusalem where they had a history of going to the baths. So they've heard the stories, um, but they have never experienced themselves the baths. And in Jordan right now and in other parts of the Arab world, there is this new nostalgia for all things Ottoman, which I will get to. Um, an Ottoman past that um, usually was conceptualized in rather negative terms. And then in Spain, where you have this new proliferation of baths, uh, it's very much caught up with recuperating or trying to um, bring to life what they call an Arab Islamic past. Because the last bath in these areas, they were closed 500 years ago. Okay? Um, but they have recuperated them. A lot of archaeological excavations of baths going on in Spain, beautiful reconstructions of the old Arab baths, and then the new baths that are called simply Arab baths. Um, and so I'm looking at nostalgia here as a practice also, not just you know, sort of content. This is one of the old waterfalls in Jordan. For thousands of years, people go to these hot springs, take the family and, and go to them. They're all up and down the Jordan Valley and down near... Um, sort of close to the Dead Sea, okay? But, so there's a long genealogy in this region of water and the body, okay? And, you know, why people uh, go to these places. And, of course, baths have always been seen as places where you, you go to heal your ailments and your aches and pains. Hygiene, you know, cleanliness, ritual, uh, ritual cleansings, um, and actually, let me go through a few of those. Um, you know, baths occur at the intersection of dirt and cleanliness, purity and impurity, private and public. And they're, you know, reading back, the, going back to the literature on the Roman baths, they're paradoxical places. They're always seen as dangerous, that something bad can go on in, the, in them, you know, that there, there's nudity, there's licentiousness, um, but people want to go to them because, of course, you become very, very clean. So there's sort of danger associated with the baths, um, especially being seen naked by other people. Uh, Elise Merdigian, who uh, writes on Ottoman Aleppo, uh, talks about a, a case in the um, 1700s in Aleppo where the jurists tried to prevent non-Muslim women from going to the baths with Muslim women. And they argued that non-Muslim women should not see Muslim women naked. And why? Because they might go and tell men what those Muslim women look like. And it didn't work. These women did not want to separate out the bath days among Christian Muslims and Jews, and they just sort of uh, kept on. But that's just an example of this, the, the dangers associated with baths. And, it's funny, I had always worked in refugee camps, and people used to always ask me, why do you go there? Aren't you scared? And I'd say, scared of what? They'd say, well, disease and danger and blah, blah, blah. And it's funny, they said the same thing when I said I'm working on baths. They said, aren't you afraid to go there? <laughs> Germs, you're going to get sick, it's dirty. And you see, the, the danger, what one woman said, she asked me, aren't you afraid to go to the baths? And I said, well, what would I be afraid of? And she said, people seeing you or taking pictures and then spreading them around. So there, there's the fear, you know, because you're so, you're vulnerable in a bath. You don't, you don't have your clothes on by and large. Okay, now going through some of these um, functions of the bath, what happens in them and what happened in them in the past and now, what's same and what's new. And they remain places for health and hygiene and health and hygiene are seen as going together in this region, going way back at a time when you know, the Europeans thought bathing would make you ill. Um, very interesting to read the encounters between travelers coming from Europe to an area where people bathed and were so clean at a time when Europeans thought if you bathed, your pores would open, and that's how disease enters the body. And Arab Islamic thinking sort of saw it as no being clean as a way to deal with um, uh, health, very uh, distinct ways. So 
always associated with health and hygiene, ritual, uh, everything from, I'm thinking of, you know, the Jewish mikvah, which is an immersion that returns you to a ritually pure state, to the Islamic, uh, the, the kinds of bathing associated with ablutions, where you do the full ablution. Um, on ritual, also, women have used baths for ritual purposes um, for thousands of years. Part of life cycle rituals before marriage, for circumcision, uh, after 40 days after birth. Uh, and that beautiful mosque, uh, sorry, hammam in uh, Istanbul, the Harim Sultan uh, bath, they had, you know, there's this list of services now at these baths, it's just wild. And that one, there was a bath for mother and new baby with 40 bowls of water and 40 spices, oh. okay, yeah. A bath for the circumcision feast, all kinds of. So they're used for, for these kinds of life cycle rituals. And now in, in Amman, bride and grooms are back to having parties in the hammam on the morning of the wedding. They rent the whole hammam. And they're having a great time doing this. And people who haven't been to the hammam end up often their first time to go is with a, a bridal party or a groom party. And then they decide, oh, this is really kind of fun. Um, these are of course, spacious spaces for relaxation and leisure, uh, homosocial spaces where people get together, socialize, nourish, nourish their friendships, okay? Um, and aesthetics, uh, many of the ideas about the very clean body uh, are achieved in the bath. If you've been to them, you know that they scrub all that dead skin off of you and it rolls off of you in big uh, chunks of skin. And then the attendant always tells you, see how dirty you are. And, <laughs> and you usually agree because you see all this stuff coming off of you. And it's funny, when I did this field work, of course, I was taking a lot of baths. Um, you do feel very, very clean. And then you realize kind of how dirty you are when you don't do this, <laughs> get all that dead skin off. So um, in any case, now, one thing, I, a little note here uh, about homosocial spaces. It's very interesting. All these baths in Turkey and in Jordan, they are single sex. Okay, they have times or days for men and women, except interestingly in Petra. Petra has mixed baths. Yeah, it's very, very odd. I mean, people find it very strange, but it's because they cater only to tourists. And um, as I interviewed one of the owners of a, one of these mixed baths in Petra, and he said, I know it's wrong. <laughs> he said, I know what we're doing is wrong, but this is business. And he said, as soon as we can, when business is good, we'll have two separate baths. Um, but the workers in the bath were males also, and it was a family, uh, family business. So there you see a mixed bath, and of course Spain, they're mixed. Um, they don't have the separate baths. But... Um, one thing that's new in these baths, you know, the sequencing of going through the bath is pretty uh, similar in most of these baths. You know, you start at the dressing area, you go into an area where you steam up, okay? And that can be anything from a little sauna, and, and most of them have jacuzzis now, uh, to getting scrubbed, I call that just the exfoliation, where you're lying on that hot stone and they are scrubbing all that dead skin off, then to being washed, get a massage, go hang out in the lounge where you cool down and you have refreshments. This is similar to all of them. And this is similar to what happened in uh, baths in the past. Mm -hmm. What's different, because these are businesses, is the, temp the temporal nature of this. You are in and out of there in an hour and a half to two hours, and they want you out. They're ringing bells that, okay, you go now, you're finished, and they're really moving you along quickly because they have these one and a half hour, two hour segments where they want you all to come in, and then you all leave, they clean it, and they start with a new group. Okay? And this is actually one of the complaints that people have is that we want to go and relax, and we can't because you have to keep moving. Uh, you can't just sort of hang out and do what you want. Now, you know, one of the main differences between the Roman baths and what we'll just call loosely Turkish and Arab baths has to do with immersion. And you can see this in the archeological record. Um, once you have the 
the first baths associated with Islam, you no longer have immersion pools. You do not sit in water. It's considered very dirty um, to sit in water that other people have sat in. And there the tradition is you know, to throw the water on yourself and let it uh, run off. And um, you know, a number of differences with the Roman baths. Roman baths were often mixed. They used very different um, instruments and um, mainly that uh, immersion issues. And all of these baths in Jordan now and Spain, of course, they, they have the jacuzzi. And one of the bath owners, she told me, she's the most older women in particular will not sit in a jacuzzi because they don't want to sit in water that other people have sat in. They still have this idea that this is very dirty. Um, now, you know, doing field work in these hammams was a challenge in some ways. Um, well, you can't take notes in there because it's steamy. You can't see because it's steamy. <laughs> you're supposed to be quiet also. Okay, you're not supposed to raise your voice. These are quiet baths, not like the old baths where people really were chit chatting and having a great time. Um, so I had to try and remember everything and reconstruct it afterwards. So I'd run to a cafe as quickly as I could and write everything down. But I gave myself sort of um, thing ways to remember, and I said, okay, do it through the senses. And I looked at things, of course, like labor and the organization of space and, and the sequencing, but I said, focus on the senses. What are the sounds in the bath? And the sound, um, you know, you're not supposed to talk, but they're noisy places because of all the water and the uh, generators. But there's music, and there's a standard music from Spain all the way to Turkey to Jordan. They play the same CD. It's called Hammam music. And, <laughs> you know, the, the, these are businesses. You know, when you go into them, you make a reservation. You can make it online or you can call in, okay? Uh, you can give gift cards. Um, they have all kinds of things for sa sale. So I looked at what is the sounds, what are the smells, and that's usually olive oil, eucalyptus, menthol. Um, what does it look like? And that's, you know, of course, it, many of these um, hammams mimic what they think are the old Turkish baths. They have the domes with the small cutout lights, but they're fake because they're underground, so they paint them up there. Or they put little light bulbs so that you get the effect. Um, taste, what are the refreshments? And touch, because bath is all about touch. And people who don't like to go to the bath, and I ask a lot of people, why don't you go? And they say, I don't like to be touched. So um, something that keeps people out. But water, I think, is what unifies the experience and the senses here. You hear it. You smell it. You um, are in it uh, the whole time you're in, in this bath. OK, so I, first I asked this question, why now? Why suddenly these baths are popping up? And then later I ask, you know, what do baths tell us about heritage, tradition, cultural revival, and what do they tell us about regions, regional consciousness? So on that first question, sort of why now, you know, what was going on in this area starting in the late, mid to late 90s that led to the emergence of these baths? And first there's questions of local heritage. You know, and I asked people, why did the baths start? And I interviewed owners, and by the way, I thought this was going to be easy after conflict <laughs> research. It's easier to ask people political questions than business ones. Business people don't like you poking into their business. Okay, like where do you get your water, which is a big deal. They don't want you asking this. And labor can't ask those kinds of questions. People get very nervous. And the labor in these places get very nervous because a lot of it is, um, undocumented labor, people hiding uh, in many ways. So in any case, uh, people talked a lot about sort of a local heritage movement starting in the late 80s, uh, particularly, uh, sorry, late 90s, particularly after the first Gulf War. There was, people told me there was a triggering of interest in local culture. And it was a time of reassessing culture is what they said. And entrepreneurs took advantage of this, and they saw a great business opportunity. And most of these hammams are owned by, uh, they're run by young men, 
Many of their families were in the tourist industry in Palestine. It's kind of interesting um, that in Jordan, this younger generation of entrepreneurs are starting these baths, whereas their parents um, were entrepreneur, uh, worked in the tourist industry, particularly in Nazareth and Hebron. Okay. Um, next, there's all things Ottoman. Okay. And for the past 10, 15 years, in places like Jordan and Syria, there's been what uh, people call the Turkish cultural invasion and Ottomania, uh, where everything Turkish is seen as of good quality, things that people want to buy, whether it's textiles or food or design. Uh, and the main thing was the uh, Turkish soap operas. I don't know if any of you are familiar with those. Oh, they're wonderful. <laughs> Uh, especially the Magnificent Century is, is the best one. Uh, and people watch these in the, in the Arab world. And there was this uh, re-examination of the Ottoman period. And I won't go into it too much here. The historians re-examining uh, the Ottoman era in the Middle East, taking a slightly more positive spin on it than the, the traditional negativeness. Uh, Turkey itself had emerged on the regional scene jockeying to be kind of a, uh, another power in the Middle East, positioning itself as the moderate modern Islamic state, and then it got a lot of capital with the Gaza issue, with the Mavi Mamara, and the position it took on um, <clears throat> the attack, the assault on, on the ships, trying to break the siege of Gaza. So everything Turkish was kind of uh, flowing through the region, and um, that's why people started calling these things Turkish bath, saying, oh, we got it from the Turks. Um, and in Spain, you had the new interest in the um, Arab past in Andalusia, very much caught up with tourism, but also just re-examining uh, that history. And um, the baths were part of that uh, recuperation. And then you have tourism and business. This is when, in this region, people are investing in the service sector as a source of revenue and, and creating jobs. And so these baths became simply businesses uh, tailored to meet demands of tourists who want experience. Okay? They don't want just to look at sites. They want to have the experience and local elites version of cultural authenticity, if you will. And um, you know, tourism is a vehicle of change. It influences the production and the nature of cultural capital of historical sites. And I would add practice here. And you know, in a place like Jordan, um, tourists weren't, and the, and the state did not promote the Ottoman past. They very much promoted, you know, Rome, the Roman ruins, um, Jarash, and of course Petra, the Nabataean and, and Byzantine past. And um, the Ottoman period just kind of got overlooked, you know, as though it, it really wasn't very important. Um, so tourism and business were capitalizing on this. Um, and all of these baths in Jordan, they're connected to something else, like Elf Leila Woleila uh, is connected to um, a big tourist shop. And the owner told me, you know, now we're building a hotel with it. And there are hotels all around it. Uh, they have logos on their towels. They have water bottles with their logos. Um, in Spain, the Al Andalus group, which is a corporation, they have four baths. They have the slogan, uh, bathe in history, immerse yourself in history. Um, <clears throat> they sell lots of products associated with the bath. All of these baths do. They sell the soaps and um, the scrubbing implements sort of thing. And there was an increased desire uh, for homosocial spaces, especially among young women um, who were interested in having uh, leisure sites that were single sex. And so you see these, these new gyms, women-only gyms, uh, cafes that cater much more to women than men, uh, swimming pools uh, in Amman that are women-only swimming pools. They're quite interesting. And the baths was another kind of site, if you will, for young urban women with some disposable income and uh, mobility and pursuing a certain kind of, of lifestyle. And I should add here, um, you know, why now? It was also this globally mediated focus on the body. Um, 
you know, magazines, TV shows. You have your version of Dr. Oz uh, in Arabic uh, purporting the, you know, the benefits of exercise and diet and being thin, okay? So you have this kind of, you know, intersection of these local factors with a global concern with bodily self-fashioning and maintenance about the body as a project of intervention uh, with business basically, coming together in this kind of commodification. Um, let me see what else I've got here. Oh, this just to give you an idea, do you know what this is? This is part of Ottomania. Um, it was, I was walking down Rainbow Street in, in Amman, and I come across this cafe that's called Sultan Harim Cafe. That's the title of a Syrian, of the Turkish soap opera that's so popular. Well, these are the main characters. So they have these cutouts that are there, there every day out on the street. That's Sultan Suleiman and that's Roxolana or Hurin. So, you know, it just gives you an idea. People are so caught up in this soap opera. Uh, and the aesthetics in this soap opera are fabulous. They're really good and it's fueled this tourism to Turkey, where people, especially as part of halal tourism, which is another industry that's fueling these visits to the bath, um, people are flocking by the thousands to Topkapi, where a lot of that was filmed. And it, 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 mainly women who love these soap operas. <laughs> so, but in any case, um, in sort of answering that question about what does all this tell us about um, you know, new ways of thinking about heritage. And, you know, here, I mean, we see that, you know, I think we need to reformulate heritage. Heritage also is a practice. It's not just these things. It's an experience rather than simply a cultural artifact. Um, that's, and, and one that is heavily commodified. And uh, James Clifford, talks about, you know, rather than use the term heritage, he said, maybe we should use conscious culture uh, to capture this objectification of heritage and consuming heritage. Okay. All right, now I just want to mention a few words about regionality and naming because I, it, that got really interesting, but let's see what else we have. That's, that's the Istanbul, that's Borsa. Um, classic kind of Turkish bath. It has the pool, but you don't sit in that water. It's just to, for looks. You sit with the, the basins. And Bursa is, has anybody been to Bursa? Yeah, up on that hill on the western side of the city are all the mineral springs and the Roman baths. And people still go there. Mainly it was old people going for um, health reasons to baths and mineral waters. And I got into this when I went early and they let me take pictures because no one was in there. Um, and by the way, many of these baths have paintings in them that are sort of 19th century orientalist paintings. In fact, one bath I went to in Beirut, it had, was it uh, Jerome or Ong's, both their, their reproductions of their paintings of the bath sort of coming <laughs> back into them. That's the bath in Bursa. It, it was really a beautiful bath. Uh, oh, that's... Sorry, and that's a little simple bath. Oh, that's <laughs> Petra. <laughs> and this was a funny bath, it was co-ed too. It's at the Marriott Hotel. And again, I got in, I could take a picture because no one was in there. Um, a very posh bath, very uh, pricey. Oh, on the other side, this was uh, one of the real old baths in Istanbul where, you know, this is what I talk about, This this fusion with the spa. You could have everything from a Thai massage to a shiatsu massage. Um, you could have acupuncture. Okay, and this was in a bath that was, I don't know, three or four hundred years old that offers these kind of services. Okay, or you could have just the traditional style. Okay, yeah, sorry, that got cut off. Okay, but um, I started asking about regions because of this naming issue. After a while, I started noticing these 
names of these baths and everyone in Jordan telling me these are Turkish baths, you know, and they're, and they say, oh, we didn't have baths before the Turks came. You know, I'd say, well, you didn't have the Romans, <laughs> you didn't have the Nabataeans, you didn't have the early uh, Muslims, the Mamluks. Uh, there are some nice Mamluk baths in, uh, in Jordan, okay. Um, so there was this regional issue going on, and I started looking at the t names of these baths. Al Pasha Turkish bath was the first of the new baths in Jordan. It self-identifies as Turkish, okay, even though it has immersion pools. This one opened about a year ago, Marrakesh Hammam. Um, all that means is they offer mud, mud services, like in a Moroccan mud, kind of a Moroccan mud. Um, it says first hammam in Jordan, they left out the first Maghrebi hammam. <laughs> But um, I just got interested in what these places were calling themselves, because they're evoking these very, very distant places. Okay, uh, that's, yeah, that's still the Marrakesh Hammam. And this was the Arab bath in, in Spain. Okay, and uh, again, what makes it Arab? It's all immersion pools. It's really a Roman bath. Uh, and this one this is my favorite bath in Jordan, Alf Leila Walayla, which has this sort of stylized Persian, supposed to be sort of Persian miniatures, but it's called a Turkish bath. Okay, so there's this real sort of mishmash um, of what's what's going on in in these baths. Yeah, this is the entrance to Alf Leila. That's the real posh bath in Amman. It's really beautiful, run by family from Hebron. Um, that's the inside. These are fake domes. And you can see the towel here with their logo on it. Um, yeah, that's that same picture. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's really a beautiful, beautiful place. But I went back and I looked at uh, names. And I found all the names. There's a wonderful book on the baths of Palestine. It has the name of every bath in Palestine. And not one of them was called a Turkish bath. <laughs> they, they all had names that were the family or the little neighborhood uh, in which one found them. So the, the, these baths, and in Turkey, of course, you don't call a bath a Turkish bath unless it's a tourist bath. And there were one or two where they advertised themselves as a Turkish bath. But it's this you know, invoking of these relationships that are regional and this mishmash of um, tradition. So I did get interested in uh, signs and um, names of baths. Um, okay. So I would just conclude by uh, looking at the way these, these, these baths are, you know, it's this intersection of local uh, issues recuperating culture, automania, intersecting with the global spa industry and business and the hotel phenomena, okay? And, um, you know, baths, if you go back in history, they are a common feature in the Mediterranean with all their different, you know, different or multiple local configurations. Um, but they still, over thousands of years, uh, provide the same kind of services in many ways. Uh, same kind of functions. And we see, um, you know, these have become places for profit in urban centers, part of urban regeneration and making urban centers cater to tourists and elite uh, desires. Okay. Uh, this is heritage as an economic asset. It provides revenue and it provides jobs. And some people, by the way, are very suspicious of the baths, especially the um, very conservative Muslims find them problematic. And you know, when you take a taxi and you tell them to drop you off at the bath, there's this kind of, some of them are asking what goes on in there. We've heard about massages. I had one taxi said, we didn't have massages until recently. This is a new thing. Um, and, and yeah, a lot of concern about what's going on in them. So um, yeah. These, you know, I would look at these as spaces and practices. It, it's sort of cultural spaces and practices in motion, rather than simply artifacts 
um, or simply a new commodification. You know, in a, in a neoliberal age, they are multiple things all at once. Thank you. Mia. I have a question. Yeah. Um, thank you, Julie. So I'm really interested in just in general in what I think of as conversions of symbolic currency, political capital, and your, what you're calling kind of the regional dimension of this. What is really striking me is the way in which two things. One, um, there's this kind of appropriation, recuperation of, it's Turkish, okay, that's a connotation of it's Ottoman, mm -hmm. so it's not Turkey now, no. right? And for the Spain place, it's not Arabs now, right? So it, there's a, so it's proximate but distant, mm -hmm. which makes it just the right yeah. register of its own for commercialism and you know, the image, right? Yeah. The other thing that's really striking me is the is the class shift. Yeah. I, you know, I think I've even in my lifetime, you know, as were the every person's way of maintaining hygiene. I wasn't yeah. there. I was in France, but you know, they got and, and, but now, so now we're talking about something that has been eliminated for the every person. Yes, and has become, you know, the spa. Yeah, yeah they the become. Spa. But so the, the but then the Hanami is the kind of site of enormous shifts and reconfiguration. It's if, you know if we use maybe the term distinctions, and you know some of the uh, scholars writing on Rome called the baths the great equalizer, which was not quite true. Uh, what they meant is, you know, sort of elites bathed with commoners, but elites it didn't equalize, didn't equalize them. Huh? But they met. They met yeah. in the baths. And in the Ottoman, you know, if you look at, and I'm just using Ottoman here for ease, the baths were low cost. They were often part of a mosque and the, the revenue, or walk, and the revenues from them went to support the mosque. Now, how do you maintain distinction in, in the bath? Well, some elites who have really large houses would have private baths in those houses, okay? Especially Istanbul and North Africa, some of them. But elites went to the baths, but they maintained distinction by how did they go to the baths? Well, they went with servants. They had a retinue. They, you know, they had the um, cloth that you put your things in. It would be silk, you know, and beautifully embroidered. They had nicer implements. I mean, class distinctions were still there. And then, you know, it's funny, one older woman said to me, um, they were from Nablus, and she said, uh, well, you know, when we came to Jordan, we bathed, and they didn't. And it was a way of making a distinction between sort of East Bank, non-urban, and these were your Palestinian urban elite from Nablus. Um, so there, there's always this element of distinction, and now, of course, uh, I, ha I had one woman, you know, sort of even middle class, and she said, well, I can't go to the, these baths. She said, I can't afford it, but she said, I go down to the Jordan Valley with the family, and we pay 7 to $10 for the day, and the whole family stays at uh, Shuna, Shamalia, uh, and we, we do, we sort of bathe and, you know, have a picnic and do that kind of thing. So, no, distinction has always been there, and it's still displayed in the bath. Um, yeah, um, this was wonderful. Thank you. And, um, I know you didn't work on Morocco for this thing. It's next. It's no. I, it's, it's the big gap. It's the yeah. big gap. Um, what one difference between Morocco and, and the Levant that I see is that um, you do have the local bathing that's mm -hmm. gone on as long as I've been going to Morocco. Yes. It goes along, alongside the very expensive, you know, tourist yeah. or whatever it is, mm -hmm. it'll cost you at least two hundred bucks. Yeah. But you have the neighborhood in Havana. Yes. Mm -hmm. And tourists can't go to those, really. Yeah. No. You can go if you go with a Moroccan friend, but if you try and go on your own, they'll send you the know you don't belong. Right? Yeah. So I, I wonder if you would kind of hazard a guess at why that those managed to exist simultaneously yeah. in some places and not in others. Yeah. Then, then the other thing I, I'm curious about is um, I did a little research on this in Morocco and talked to people working in Havana. And there are men and women massaging men, uh, oh. men massaging women. And so I asked the young women there, I was like, do, do your families know you work here? Yeah. And they don't. No. <laughs> um, they made a lot of good money, but 
that yeah. um, it was they, they had to hide that they weren't there. Yes. And I wonder if that's and, and there's a tension between you know there's a lot of status working in the tourist industry, especially in a fancy place, but if your mother knew that you were massaging with the naked men. Oh gosh. Yes, you'd be in big trouble. <laughs> okay, well, I'll answer the labor question second, but I, you were talking about the baths as what, what I would call living traditions. And I think in, you know, in particular in North Africa where you still have very crowded medinas like Fez, where people don't have baths in the home and you still have the neighborhood bath, and I know there are literally hundreds in Morocco. And for people, it, I think it's a spatial issue and housing where you don't have the baths and so ordinary people still go to the baths and it is a great social time for women also. Um, kind of get out of the house and, and you know, go to the bath and have fun. And Syria in some areas still had the old traditional baths where tourists didn't go. And then you have the new ones. So it's, I think where you had the living hammam was where you had this urban kind of crowding and substandard housing without baths in the house. Now on the labor issue, labor was really interesting. And um, when I first started going to hammams in Jordan, the labor was all foreign, uh, South Asian women by and large, okay? And it has gradually turned into Jordanian women, okay? Over the past few year, three years because the government was trying to uh, put a limit on the number of foreign workers, okay, and encouraging local employment. So they made it more and more expensive and difficult for women to get, um, uh, you know, visas, work visas to stay and work. So you have the switch to Jordanian labor, and when you ask the Jordanian workers, they're very hesitant to tell you where they come from or who they are. But I noticed quite a few of them, if you ask them where they're from, they were from Beersheba. Um, it was interesting, and I, I don't know why, but I noticed it across the board. A lot of them came from that area, and they were from the Jordan Valley, refugees sort of who settled in the Jordan Valley and then had come into this very stigmatized work. And um, some of the young women working in the hammams, who, especially now the Jordanians who do massages, they actually have degrees in physiotherapy. And um, this is a place for them to work, but it's still stigmatized. In Ramallah, um, in the bath I went to, one of the young uh, girls, uh, she had her degree in physiotherapy, and her parents were horrified that she was working in the bath. But she said, you know, there's no men. There are no, you know, it was single sex. And she was earning decent salary and tips, but yeah, she wasn't gonna tell anybody where she worked. She said it was very shameful. Um, and I was listening to that, it was one of those Ottoman podcasts I told you about with a Turkish Ottoman scholar, and she talked about the labor pool in the hammams in, in Istanbul as always being villagers. Uh, very stigmatized, poorly paid, a lot of Albanians and Romanians um, did it, but not urban sort of Istanbulis, if you will. So yeah, it's stigmatized. Um, so I wonder whether there is also this, I mean, what struck me in the, in the lecture is that there's something about these baths that at once belongs to the past mm -hmm. and at the same time is somewhat compatible with modernity or with modern conditions. Right. And that is its appeal. And they're in the Arab world today or in Turkey mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. There aren't that many places and sites that do that. Yes. Because otherwise what one is living is a rupture, right? And yes. that burden of denying your past in favor of a modernity that you must learn to yeah. inhabit and live yeah. and become modern and be modern. And baths are one of those rare, I don't know what other sites, I was trying yeah. to think what other sites exist yeah. that sort of enable that continuity. And of course it's not that it was continuous, but that today right. it can be constructed as a continuity. Um, well, there yeah, is a kind of though. I mean, there, it is really immerse yourself in history. I mean, yeah. so it's history that is is today, and it does not offer. I mean, despite everything that we were talking about yeah. now, how they're stigmatized and so on and so forth for the workers. Yeah. But for the consumers, 
they offer a kind of continuity that is not burdened by the distinction between the modern and the traditional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, they, it's kind of this, they've managed to fuse these. And, and some women who, who go to these, they, they even use the English, they say, it's me time. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, see, they've adopted this sort of global discourse of, you know, I'm a harried uh, young mother and I work. And this is one of the few spots, aside from the mall, because, you know, in a place like Jordan, there are very few really public places mm -hmm. where one can go and, um, you know, enjoy oneself in, in public groups of girls. And so I think along with the cafes and the malls and the gyms, the new gyms, which are very interesting, and some have the baths in the gym also, it's become this kind of homosocial space where you're living that nostalgia without memory, you know, of your, your grandparents or your, your parents, but you're living a very modern life because you're taking care of your body. It's the wellness factor mm -hmm. and keeping yourself in good shape. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What sort of refreshments are served after the bath? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's um, fun. In, in the Moroccan one, well, you always have tea. When you're in the bath, they often bring you uh, pomegranate juice or karkadi. Karkadi is hibiscus, I think. Karkadi, yeah. Karkadi tea or uh, mint tea. And then they'll give you a little plate of cookies. And it was funny, I was in um, Athens a couple weeks ago. And I said, well, while I'm in Athens, I'll see what, what they've done. Talk about getting rid of the Ottoman. They're, it's like there's no one. They were never here. <laughs> Everything is just glossed over. Um, but there's a new hammam in, uh, in Athens, beautiful hammam, built very much in the Turkish style with the wood and the tears, and it's called hammam. And of course, I made a reservation, and I went, and I said, oh, it's a Turkish bath, and she looked at me like, no, it's a hammam. I said, okay. <laughs> but what they served there was where they served tea and then Turkish delights. <laughs> I called it Turkish delights. I don't know what she called it, but they bring you a little plate of, uh, yes, yeah. Um, so yeah, you, you are given uh, refreshments. And you know, in the baths, uh, in the old days, if, if I may use that term loosely, uh, women used to take their cooked food and they would eat in the baths. They would make a day of it. And I did have the opportunity to go to one of the old baths in Damascus in the early 1970s. Um, and women were in there for hours and they brought uh, platters of food, they had fruits, they, it was a very festive time. They had their kids, a lot of singing and dancing and uh, eating. That's not going to go on now in the Hamad, no. It's all hygiene and they're very clean. They're constantly cleaning these because there is this, uh, this whole question of um, danger with the germs. And licentiousness in all of these, you have to ring a bell to get in and they look at you before you come in. And one of them in downtown Amman, uh, they have a camera that photographs you and then you're allowed in and they take your cell phone, very security conscious. Well, it's downtown Amman and I think they're very worried about Islamists and, and men becoming suspicious of these places. Like, you talked a lot about the desire, and even now in the comments, right, the desire that women have to, like, have access to a kind of homosocial space. Yeah. Um, and I wonder how that gets reconciled with the other thing of, oh, what you're talking about, like, it's all about hygiene, it's not about, you know, when I think about, um, and I don't know anything about Arab baths, or Ottoman baths, or like, so, um, but I know about Iranian baths. Oh, okay. And so, um, the history of that being exactly what you were describing, right, about your 70s experience in the bath, of like, is this day long affair? And so when people write about homosociality in baths like this, it's about, um, it's about the relational aspects, mm -hmm. and not the bath, right? But it's right. a space that you um, forge particular kinds of relationships. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering, how that gets reconciled with like this sort of weird new neoliberal-esque sort of desire yeah. for a homosocial space with the, the like the limitations you're talking about around sound, like you can't talk really loud, which is all yeah. about what the back is about. I know. That that's that's a good point, and I found the sound thing very interesting because of course I wanted to talk to people and I was often shushed. Um, <laughs> which made field work hard if you can't talk. 
Um, but young women, they, tend, they don't go to the baths alone. They go with friends or with parties. And then, you know, there'll be slight chit-chat. But I'm not sure, I, I don't know that I see a contradiction there, if that's what you were asking, between these old baths and the new ones, except I, I, for me, the temporal was the most important thing, that you are on a schedule. And you have to stay on that schedule. You couldn't just hang out there all day. And you were spending a lot of money, which leaves out large sectors of the population. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.